people came down as individuals. Uh, you're not, no longer uh, uh, sacrifice all your rights because your sect, your tribe is getting benefits, or at least the leaders of these sects are getting benefits. People now uh, have uh, the same pains, maybe not in the same degrees, but at least the same feelings. The difference also is, is the generation. There's a generational revolution here. Social media and all that has, uh, has made them more individualistic, has made them more uh, aware of what they want and what they don't want. They're willing to fight for it. Mm. I mean, we've had mm. a sort of a democracy here, you know, uh, Alaba, you know, not uh, not full, but this is a, 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 a major leap. The past 40 or 50 days mm -hmm. that we've seen, I think the, the development in the national uh, democratic feeling yeah. uh, uh, has um, has leapt years ahead, and the co the, the camaraderie between people is just amazing. Yeah. Uh, coming from different tribes, <laughs> and I mean here different religions, or coming from different social uh, 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 status, mm. you see a certain uh, uh, fusion of them in terms of uh, mind and soul, which we hadn't seen before. And this is, uh, this is the right step towards democracy. Is it going to lead to a proper democracy? I think we have leapt a big step forward. Yeah. And I think, uh, yes, there's something that tells me there's something that will stay out. I'm curious from your perspective, because you've now, with your own eyes, you've had decades of sort of watching things evolve politically and economically. And it would be hard to imagine a time where the economic pain was more than today. The people are genuinely suffering on. And I mean, it goes back to civil war years, that kind of suffering, that sharp pain. Do you think that this uprising or this upswell of emotion, democratic or not, do you think the, the major component is the economic crisis? And I'm asking because if things were to improve economically or to readjust where people are not in such a bad situation, do you think they would still have the same political demands that we're seeing? And is this something that there's no going back from? I think, I think there's an element, I mean, people hate the Arab Spring and all that, I don't. I think Can you, a, a lot of people you say, mean, you know, yeah. the Arab Spring is a, you know, uh, just an, any uprising that happened and, you know, dwindled away. I don't think it's, a, mm. it's a, again, a stepping stone yeah. uh, uh, for something forward. Obviously, the economic situation does, doesn't, I mean, didn't help and help people make a decision. So as, as we mentioned before, there's a generational uh, revolution here, yes, yes. where those those people don't want to hear about, you know, uh, 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 other people's problems. Mm -hmm. uh, they they travel. They know uh, what economics is uh, is all about because they're online and they, they yeah. see the, the, the cost of living and all that and what they need to live well. And they most of them are well traveled or well read. Uh, and but they, many, many are not. And many are not, yeah. But they don't want, there's a, there's a fear factor that is going, and people are saying, we just want to live. There is no reason why uh, this country could, should be so uh, dirty, for example, you know, in the streets or the rivers or the seas and all that. There is no re need for it not to be green. You know, it doesn't take much. <laughs> uh, the, the political class has, especially in the last seven, eight years, has kind of turned their back on people and uh, all they did was grab, 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 grab and people have had enough. So the, the economic... And people realize that. Yeah, but, but so let's say the economic downward spiral that we saw the last, particularly the last decade, do you think that now it's too late to save the power sharing model that you were touching on earlier, I, the old way of I, governing? I can't see how it can survive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, at least... Uh, not in, without force. I mean, it could, right, it could right. be forced, it could yeah. be coerced, it could be 
uh, imposed, mm -hmm. which it has been actually, if we want to think about it, since yeah. 2000, and, you know, since 91. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was the Syrians that took that role, mm -hmm. and then after 2005, Hezbollah that has played that role. Yeah. And Hezbollah, unfortunately, represents, is, a, is part of the, uh, at least the official part of it, is part of the Quds Brigade, uh, Brigades, which is part of the uh, military uh, revolutionary uh, guards uh, of Iran. And they admit this, and we see it. Um, so let's actually, that's a nice way to kind of go back in time, because that is the current paradigm, where you have a group's ability to impose its, its what it thinks is detrimental to its survivability. But let's go back. And I'd like to have your perspective on years where you were younger. And I think your voice is actually quite pertinent because you grew up as the son of a famed Lebanese journalist who paid the ultimate price for expressing his views his way. And we're seeing expression today on an individual level and I can only imagine that, that were, what we're seeing now was really the dream of many journalists who paid the ultimate price. Many, many, many people, of many normal citizens at the time, many people have that, had that feeling uh, uh, but you what, growing up as a, as a yeah, younger sort yeah, of citizen, yeah. and I'm, I'm going to guess from the 1960s, your yeah. childhood, this way of covering the news and the determination that the pen is mightier than the sword, that ultimate, ultimate principle. When your father delivered two major papers in Lebanon, Al Hayat, an Arabic paper, and Daily Star. The third one we both kind of talked about before recording, yeah, Beirut Meta, which was just a uh, fleeting moment. But I, if I'm not mistaken, he is the only Lebanese citizen to have delivered papers in all three languages. Absolutely. And that's quite an accomplishment, and in a short period of time. And they're still around, aside from the French one, Hayat and Daily Star survive today. Did you see yourself as a kid wanting to participate in that form of expression? Did you see yourself as not necessarily just a journalist, or not somebody who's covering the news in particular, but somebody who would sort of join a movement that is full of these kinds of voices? And we can talk about them at length. But did you ever imagine as a child that this would be your destiny in Lebanon? No, this, yeah. I mean, when, when my father was assassinated, I was six years old. Mm. Uh, and that, uh, that leaves, the, uh, it marks you in different ways, and then you grow up and you have to know him from his writings and from. So you have to make your own mind. You don't know the person, whether you like sure. him or not. Yeah. But I, um, uh, no, I always thought uh, that I'll be part of at least a drive to, uh, to move this country. At the time, we used to think of the area more and more, you know, mm. the Arab, mm. uh, Arab world and all that. But uh, definitely, uh, uh, I, I always knew that I'll, I'll will try to play a role, uh, as small as, as it might be, mm -hmm. to push this country towards uh, proper democracy and proper uh, social uh, equality. And did you see that through the journalism medium? Did obviously, obviously, be, being and living in a, you know, in a, uh, we have, I've worked in newspapers, I've worked on Al Hayat, i worked mm -hmm. on the Daily Star, so yes, you're a, uh, you have a public uh, um, Concerns, your public concerns are high, high up on your uh, uh, priority level in one's life. Yeah. Uh, so obviously that that helped and pushed and aided somehow. Yeah. Um, so yes, I mean this is this is absolutely it's been always been there and the uh, the, the the powers that can be in Lebanon that have been ever since independence are exactly the same. You know, power sharing. It, it might be less uh, less lethal than it is now, less uh, toxic as it would now. Mm. It reached the point where it, it became too too um, uh, too apparent as as we've seen in the past ten years. Yeah. But it's basically the same name, the same people, and the same uh, same system. I think the system uh, might have worked at a certain point, uh, but uh, it's not what a lot of people dreamt of even back in the 50s and 60s, uh, people dreamt of a better world and of a better Lebanon. And uh, we're edging towards that. We have still a long way to go, but we're edging slowly in the right direction. But can I ask you, your, your personal opinion on freedom of expression in Lebanon, 
even during the worst of times, even after tragedy, after assassinations, journalism, free expression survives in this country. And it's al it always seems to triumph, even as the political situation decays, even as economies implode, even as people are broke, you still have a flourishing journalism uh, s scope in this country. Well, I'm wondering, what, what do you put that on? Because other, every other country in this part of the world has not seen that kind there's of vibrancy. A, there's a history of that. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the geography of this country, you mm -hmm. know, being mountainous and being the, the, uh, the refuge of many uh, minorities and all that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you put journalism's success story to those years. Of course, because, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there's nothing that you can, you can uh, nourish uh, 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 in an attitude in people within you know, one or two generations. Yeah. It's something that is installed in the genes mm -hmm. somehow. I mean, that's pompous to say, but that's, that's the reality <laughs> of things. Uh, so yes, I mean, it, it, it's, it's something that is installed in the Lebanese, uh, um, uh, in the, uh, and it goes back years and years and years. I mean, hundreds of years. Uh, the, the first newspaper, the first printing press in this part of the world, if I'm not mistaken, was the Hadiyat al-Akhbar. And that's in the 18, late 19th century. Late, that's Ottoman... Late 19th century, yeah. Right. 18th century. And I mean, that's, you know, 120, 130 years ago, Lebanon, or this part of the world at least, modern Lebanon, seems to be way ahead of the curve. And I, if I'm getting, if I'm getting this right, it's the pluralism of Lebanon that allowed it to have this kind of breathing space for expression. Yes, and and also because the infighting in Lebanon invited a lot of foreign powers, and these foreign powers uh, created, uh, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, the most precious these things we do, which is education. So that's interesting. Uh, the geopolitics of this part of the world produced. The press, absolutely. The press freedom that absolutely. we see today. It, 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 it produced the education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. AUV is, is the yes. uh, yeah. 18, 1865, it's followed by USG just after that. You had schools all over since. Uh, uh, so there's a there's a long time, uh, a long period of proper education mm -hmm. where the whole area didn't have it. Maybe a little bit Palestine before 48. But, uh, uh, so that, you put it there. That absolutely, this, this absolutely. kind of it just happened in this part of the world because of its geopolitics uh, uh, um, and its upheavals. Mm -hmm. Just created an opportunity for something to sprout by uh, maybe by mistake. Yeah, because it, it is it stands out. Absolutely. I mean, but you know, I never thought of it this way yeah. that geopolitics as well stands out here. Absolutely. So they kind of may fall yeah. in the same. You know, they're in the same world. Yeah. And that maybe news is not local here. News is regional. News is And news has never been known. Yeah. News, when, when really my, father, my, yeah. my father created Al Hayat, Lebanese news were third page, fourth page. Of the local paper. Of the local right. paper. Right. Everything was international in Arab. Because. Yeah, I think that probably has been the same since. Because really, <laughs> uh, 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 most of the. Uh, anything that happened around us affects us because of, again, our division yeah. and our diversity, which is a curse in a sense, but it sprouted up, as I said, the, 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 uh, the universities and education, because it, and all the powers that the West at the time, different powers wanted, you know, where uh, there was a competition of who opens more, more, and, and uh, your, more even, schools. Even your father's legacy is not tied to domestic affairs. He wasn't uh, chasing the municipality over any not issue. At all. He not was at all. going after regional players. Not at all. And his, I mean, that, that says it, I think, that the most, the father of modern Lebanese journalism paid the ultimate price for explaining regional problems. Absolutely. In Lebanon, absolutely not and Lebanese problems in no, Lebanon. No. Yeah, and and uh, we still we we're still uh, we somehow uh, modernity in the Arab world, especially after the coup d'etats, uh, the military coup d'etats that happened since the 1950s, 52 mm -hmm. in, in Egypt and then uh, onwards in Iraq and Syria and all that, uh, basically stopped the it stopped the regional press from flir it it's killed not off only press it's, yeah. it stopped. Uh, the, the, the Darwinian development of a society, because what you have is basically a military uh, uh, iron fist yeah. uh, 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 that governed with with 
uh, uh, fire and 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 uh, uh, and uh, you know muhabarat uh, all the time and stop the normal progression of society. I mean, if we look at uh, uh, at Egypt, all you have to do is watch the movies that were done uh, pre-1952, pre-revolution uh, there. Yeah. I mean, the movies were as good as Hollywood, uh, Hollywood movies. Uh, uh, we, we have to start looking at ourselves and realizing that we have done, in Lebanon, as much as in, in the area also, even more in the area, that we were not up to the job. The people that governed us, basically uh, the military regimes that took over, uh, failed miserably. They didn't deliver on uh, on security. Yeah. They didn't deliver on uh, you know Palestine and all the they use Palestine as a as a uh, uh, an excuse for anything and all their mistakes and uh, uh, and they failed on that. They failed on the economy. They failed on social uh, uh, advancement. This basically they failed on modernity. This is an area that is if I have to look at their policies and thinking and all that, and it's becoming more and more with the Iranian revolution and their thoughts, and all they talk about is, is legends and, and you know, history and uh, this, this Sayyid and that uh, prophet, and, and this is... Do you see journalism's role, in, at least here in Lebanon, as trying to push those tendencies away? It has always been, uh, it has always been at least the free press, mm. Uh, and it's in heydays in the 60s and mid 70s, it was uh, uh, actually uh, uh, heading or spearheading that kind of movement right. in most of the uh, independent newspapers. But obviously, we had the war, we had setbacks, but the tradition lives on. You know, uh, I, I remember these oral history, these tales of Egyptian, and Syrian, and Palestinian writers choosing Beirut as their as their place of work. Because every, everywhere else, you, you, couldn't, you, you yeah. couldn't, because of the military regimes exactly. that, were, that, were, uh, that took over. You look at even a place like 69, you look at Libya. I mean, it had a vibrant, uh, starting, a budding, vibrant press. They had a budding uh, 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 democracy. That, I mean, they actually, you had one or two prime ministers were actually voted down in parliament. Yeah. I mean, this is unheard of these days. <laughs> This is when, I mean, these are Bedouins at the time, nobody was educated, but still it was there. What the, the, the crime of uh, 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 the coup d'etats that happened in the Arab world has basically uh, frozen uh, time, uh, uh, hijacked history, and blinded the future. We so don't see the future. This is actually a nice way of touching on a parallel subject. You just described the massive failure of, of politics in this part of the world and of politicians politicians and the way they deliver absolutely and we I mean, we have endless examples of how things did not go right but I'm curious because this is now I mean we're looking at six seven decades of, of political political malignancy and economic collapse Lebanon aside most of the countries you just described were very heavy-handed top-down secular states and we can they abuse that word they took advantage of that word and made it into I think they found they found the worst forms of secularism and they somehow perverted that word into something else and it's true dictatorship the sectarianism that evolved in these societies was a byproduct of the brutal force these regimes imposed that's the failure of failure on, on dictatorships Lebanon did not have a secular experiment in the 20th century. Lebanon was kind of shielded from that. And I think it's an unusual situation. Lebanon danced around it, flirted with facets of it, but never fully embraced secular governance. 2019, it almost seems like the region is fed up with their form of secularism, and Lebanon is ready to try it out. And I'm, I'm curious, is that... What you see on the streets now, people are against the regime, people are calling on the end of sectarianism. Do you think that they are wishing for some form of secular state to emerge here? Absolutely. And, and do you think the region is any example for how secularism could look here? In other words, would secularism be abused here the way it's been abused no. in Syria and Iraq? Secularism in the area 
was basically used as dictation as a form of dictatorship. Now, because of the misuse of that, mm -hmm. we had the rise of political Islam, because people in the area, whenever they had to, you know, the only place where they can say anything against the government was in mosques. That's true. So basically, uh, uh, you know, the religious religious Islam in both both its form, whether whether Sunni or Shia, has had emerged as the uh, as the answer. Yeah. Uh, and uh, thank God, after the Arab Spring, which I still believe in, and I think it's a whole process, uh, we have tried these uh, 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 Islamic uh, um, forms of government, and they're failing miserably. I mean, we saw the Arab Brotherhood, whether in Egypt, whether in, um, in uh, Tunisia, whether in all their movement, and now in Libya, uh, they fought and fought terribly. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the example of Iran uh, as, a, as a Shia form of uh, uh, Islamic government is a, another catastrophe. And whatever, wherever they have extended their tentacles, these countries become a catastrophe, yeah. which, is, uh, uh, which is something that it, it really, what Iran is passing through is, um, I think, has to do a lot it's very similar to what happened to the Soviet, Soviet Union in the 1970s. Hmm. Uh, it had a very tenacious form of uh, uh, ideology. Hmm. Yeah. At the time, it was uh, uh, communism. Yeah. And they wanted to create an empire, so they wanted to, you know, with, um, Central and South uh, um, Asia. America. In America, yes, yeah. true. And they just overspread their tentacles while their economy was in tantrums. I mean, there was nothing in their economy. We thought it was a superpower and uh, it failed economically. And uh, we're having somebody like Trump now with his, uh, you know, somebody that I abhor as a person, but came and uh, with, the, with the sanctions on, on, um, on Iran today, mm -hmm. we're seeing it's faltering economically because all they're selling their people a revolution, they're selling people glory, but they're forgetting about, you know, bread and butter every day. So th this debate in, in Lebanon, between, between power sharing along confessional lines and a true secular state, it's got nothing to do with the it's 20, a it's, 20th century. No, it's a different, uh, we were talking about history, but it's yeah. a different experience in Lebanon. Mm. This was in the area. While in Lebanon, because you had the different sects, yeah. okay, uh, um, and secularism was uh, was not a veil, you know, uh, because of education, you have that. But uh, uh, people were scared from each other and decided the power sharing of sectarian. You know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, that worked for a while. Yeah. But we're the 21st century and, you know, you, you, democracy is something that you build and you move forward. It's not something that is you know, we decide it's, it's going to happen overnight. Now, this is actually a perfect way to ask you about some a friend of yours, somebody that I admire, somebody that I used to regularly pay tribute to on my tour. Uh, I always end the tour with Samir Asir's quotes next to his statue. Yeah. And I, uh, whenever I can do the tour these days, I still end it with Samir Asir. Um, actually, I'm very glad. This is the rare chance that Martyrs Square and Samir Asir Garden are alive. Yeah. But I don't need to do the tour. Yeah. The, they're speaking for themselves. I know Samir Asir stood for secular principles. And I know that from my learning about this man, there's not one sectarian bone in him. Yes. And he, he was a multitude of identities. French writer, an Arabic writer, a historian, a historian teacher, journalist, professor leftist in Ashrafi and uh, a man who's able to carry a man who could wear many hats but feel very comfortable at once Syrian Palestinian Lebanese it took a while it took a while yeah for him to feel comfortable and I think the the, the uh, aftermath of the killing of Hariri in 2005 made that possible because he mm. he he became uh, uh, maybe mit more mature he became more comfortable by being half Palestinian and in uh, uh, in the middle of Ashraf, you know, living in Ashrafi, he became 
uh, very comfortable about being Lebanese and being an Arab at the same time. After uh, Hadid's assassination. You know, just leading to that time. This is where, mm. where a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of feelings, a lot of people matured yeah. somehow. Yeah. And uh, uh, he became comfortable with all that, being a historian and being a, 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 you know, a column writer. Yeah. Uh, these are, are many facets of, of uh, one person that was, was an extraordinary man. And he seems to define two things to me, freedom of expression at all costs and also secularism. But I want to ask you, because you knew him for a few years and you, you knew him in, in the years that he became politically, more politically active. The secular goals that he would have wanted for Lebanon, do you think they line up with what people are protesting oh, today? Absolutely. Can absolutely. You, so can you expand on this for me? Because well, I, because I'm I'm <clears throat> seeing both. I'm yeah. seeing the March 14 movement and I'm seeing today. And I know that he would have loved debates. I know that he would have loved pure politics on the streets. But what exactly is lining up with his values today, 14, 15 years later? Okay. Um, the million people that went down to Lebanon uh, to, uh, on the 14th of March, mm. obviously it was, uh, 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 it was the anger and the sadness of, uh, of the demise of, of uh, 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 Rafi al-Hariri. But a lot of them came down because they wanted a state. They wanted yeah. things to change. They, at the time, we wanted the Syrian regime that was, was uh, heavy-handed uh, controlling the country. Mm -hmm. We thought by getting them out, uh, we will be able to create a state. Yeah. And when you create a state, we're really thinking of the right of a the citizen then. Yeah. And the right of citizen doesn't come, come with, 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 uh, with, with sectarianism. Right. So, oh, so he was opposed to that model from the from back? Absolutely. We're yeah. all, we're all, yeah. we were, we, I mean, we all, there, were, there are pockets in the society in, from different sects that have that kind of feeling and have that kind of yeah. uh, non-sectarian uh, in, in uh, inherited and inbred uh, feeling. And uh, uh, it's, it's on lesser degrees uh, 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 with other people. But we've all been, Samir and others, I mean, uh, uh, that that been struggling for a moment like this, where people are wake up and decide and, and realize that, uh, um, you know, the rights of the Maronites or the Shias or the uh, Sunnis uh, uh, are not his right just because his leader is making the money and you know uh, uh, stealing the government and uh, yeah. more than the other. That was the kind of model that we were put in. Um, you know, if I'm uh, if I'm a Sunni, I'm very happy. If my leader is very happy, I mean, it doesn't work that way, my friend. Before 14, and, um, 15 years ago, that was his goals to get us out of that prison. Absolutely. Today, are people in your in your assessment are people embracing a new order? Are, are we seeing the beginning I, of I, something I, else? I think, as, as again we mentioned earlier, I think yes, the new generation has, uh, or most of the new generation that I'm seeing, yeah. um, has no iota of, of, sec of sectarianism in them. So what does, uh, what does a new social contract then, what does it look like to you? Because I can't see it. And I'm saying this as somebody who supports this moment. Absolutely. Somebody absolutely. who really wants to see a, a new, a better society, a better government, a better politics. I don't know what it looks like. Ron, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I think uh, there's no turning back. I mean, mm. we've, we've moved forward. There's a mm. big, big step forward. Yeah. Uh, and then, I mean, uh, you're mentioning uh, 14th, and the 14th of March was 2000, I mean, years ago. Lebanese politics has changed, or the political game for the, for the powers that be has changed. You know, you see them today trying to uh, claim, uh, um, you know, there's a claim to be uh, holy and claim to be honest and all that. And what, what, is, what is happening is that the, 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 this revolution they put the check and balances on their movements. Mm -hmm. It has a veto power on that. Yeah. Uh, uh, and we will, we've seen it with, you know, with the governments uh, trying to be formed, and I think you know, it will have a veto power. So there's, really, is, there's no way for this regime, in the way we know it, the way we've seen it, there's no way for it to stick around. Well, I mean, they're coming, <clears throat> and, and it's something that they've built 
yeah. thrive on, and this is, you know, this is how they exist. And, and the we'll, if, if mm. we'll be very naive if we think they're going to turn their back and, and yeah. deliver you all that. They'll play it. They'll, they'll play any rotten game, yeah. including going down with the people as they did, claiming it as their own. Yeah. Uh, but no, there is something that has changed. I think it is more solid than we all think. And I think we'll move forward. It's not going to be tomorrow. At the beginning, you, you said something that's always on my mind. The ability of a group, whether today it's Hezbollah or in the past it could have been other groups, in the future it may be other groups as well. Mm-hmm. A group outside of the state apparatus with its own means to violence that is able to potentially hijack a movement or a revolution or at least steer it in a different direction. Are there any mechanisms in place to make sure that the well, what we both saw was the violent end of March 14 mm-hmm. and it was but there were visible targets in March 14, and by and large, the most effective targets were eliminated. Uh, it was not a leaderless movement in its inception. Maybe the weeks leading up to March 14 were leaderless, but March 14 and beyond, the leadership yeah. took the reins. And it, 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 didn't, it didn't succeed, partially due to violence. But that aside, this, this for the time being remains leaderless the 2019 events, up until now, it's hard to put a name to anything that's Absolutely. going on. And people have tried and they haven't succeeded. So that may be the way to preserve the fluidity of the, mo- of the moment, that you can't target individuals per se because there's not one person to target. But how do we find a safety mechanism to prevent violence from, de- from derailing this, mo- this revolution? Well, I mean, look, uh, uh, if we're talking about Hezbollah being the, 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 the power that has the violence, violent tool, tool in their hands, and they've used it a couple of times, uh, there are two reactions. The reactions of the revolution has been, or the revolutionaries, because uh, has been just amazing. Yeah. First, they're not Absolutely. scared. Absolutely. Yeah. First, they're not scared. Yeah. You know, before, if we remember on, in, in 2008, they just had to get a uh, get few uh, thugs with, with black, uh, black t-shirts all around the city, and the whole uh, policy, policies and politics changed. Yeah. Uh, it ain't all gonna happen now. This is not happening. And, uh, um, and the reaction of the protesters was not sectarian. Absolutely. It was killon yani killon, and they stuck uh, to uh, it. And, yeah. they, you know, and they stuck to it, yeah. and then didn't resort to violence yeah. either. Um, now, this is something that we command, and this is not something that's very hard to upkeep. And yeah. I, but, but these, you know, people on the streets seem to be uh, uh, to realize that's that's the only way they can they can survive uh, 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 the counterattacks, mm. and they're doing it superbly without leaders. Why do we need leaders? Why? I mean, these are citizens. Eventually, so, leaders. Uh, uh, it's not. It's not like much for the, you know, to sex and parties and all that. It's, so you know, if you were to strategize here and sort of give advice to protesters, it would be to remain killon yani killon and don't don't form any visible leadership for the time being. No need. But then, how does this translate to political power later? It does. It's already already the revolution today has a veto power, something that only Hezbollah or the Syrians have. What do you mean by that? It what has a veto power. If they don't like the prime minister, they, you know. Well, okay. Yeah. So I, I mean, this, I wasn't going to ask you this particularly because yeah. it's very new. But yeah. I'd like your opinion. It's the potential candidate that's been Absolutely. nominated. I mean, I, I, yes, Samir Khatib, who we don't really know because we. I have we heard his voice. I don't know how he looks. Like. We know his company, but we don't know yeah. him. Yeah. Uh, do you think if the protesters don't want him, he'll be? Because it seems like it's a. I think. Look. Uh, uh, I don't know where it's, I mean, I don't have a a, a crystal ball, but I think if they pass him, which might happen, it looks like it, yeah, Uh, people in the streets, then they'll have a veto power over each and every minister he's going to nominate. Anybody, any names that people in the streets so this is a small country. People know who is uh, who is uh, uh, good, who is bad, who is corrupt, who is not. 
who is competent who is not. That's funny. So That's basically, the... <laughs> yeah. basically, you have yes, there will be a veto power, and it will be used. But so, but again, I'll so ask that you. is that what? is the political power that you're looking at. It will be used meaning that people will keep going back to the street. Absolutely. People. Okay. So in other words, protesting is the veto power, demonstrating. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so it's not necessarily forming a political party. It's I don't think it's too early for. It. I mean, mm -hmm. we don't we don't know. We might uh, that might come at a later stage. It needs elections. We don't people. I mean, when I say we, I consider myself as part of the revolution. We don't have a, a right of saying anything. We don't form a government. Yeah. We don't decide as the prime minister. It's the powers that be that kill on yani kill on. We're we're trying to to go worse to do something right and proper for the country. We're not, yeah. you know, we don't, you know, we didn't revolt because this is paradise. We revolt because, we revolted because this is hell. So, uh, uh, and it's, it's uh, us and potential uh, donors to this country are yeah. asking for simple and straightforward reforms and they don't want to do that. And this, uh, this group will never be able to reform itself. No one reforms themselves. They have to go to rehabilitation. And, you know, they're not going to do that. So uh, uh, the, the, the revolution has won, has won a veto power that is... I don't, want to, I don't want to be too hard on the, on the protesters because I admire the determination. It's 49 days now yeah. into the revolt. Do you, do you think time is a factor in terms of testing the abilities of the protesters to keep going back to the streets, keep well, demanding. Well, I mean, the, 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 the politicians have... Because uh, uh, it seems like everyone is tired, including no, the protesters. It's not, not, like, absolutely, they're yeah, tired. Yeah. Sure. No, but, but I mean, everyone top... Yeah, to, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So even the prime minister is tired. Yeah. Or the president, I think, has been asleep but for a long but time. time yeah. But time, time is, is not going to be kind to, uh, um, to the... Um, Prime Minister mm. to be or whoever, mm, mm, mm. because you have an economic crisis yeah. that's going to uh, 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 worsen and worsen and worsen by the day. And if it's not the right formula, uh, where you can gain a bit of trust of the people in the streets and people abroad, yeah. the economics, the economic situation is going to worsen day by day. Yeah. So it's it's really uh, it balances balances out being you know the protesters being tired right. and the the economy being. What if they can't pay the uh, the military regime, the military powers in Lebanon uh, in two months? So in other what's going to happen to the Shia Shia and Shia population that supports Hezbollah? Because obviously not every all the Shia supports Hezbollah. That for some, for you know, obvious reasons, uh, 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 um, being you know attached to such leadership, when they can buy yeah. a piece of bread, this is happening. Uh, wrong. What happened since the, we had the closure of the banks for a couple of weeks, yeah. and uh, after they opened, things went so bad, it's, it's a free fall. Yeah. And nobody uh, is able to uh, give a recipe for, um, for stopping that, except people having confidence in their governing body. And this is not going to happen. So it's yes, almost it's like threefold. it's an optim. It's there is optimism in how bad things are that people will not tolerate this level again. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's going to get worse. I mean, we're hearing people yeah. actually committing suicide. This True. is on a this daily is basis. Unheard of. Um, we're sitting in the Tajadut office, and uh, we're here alone because it's late. There's two people on the wall here. Both of them I admire. We have Samir Asir and we have Nasib Lahoud. Could you tell me a bit about your relationship with Nasib Lahoud? I, I knew him just in terms of, I knew him the way many Lebanese knew him. And I knew that he was an honest man. And I knew that he stood for his principles. And I knew that if there should have been a Lebanese president nominated, when that opportunity came, it would have definitely should have been him. Unfortunately, it wasn't him. His politics, his vision, and your relationship with him. Could you tell me a bit about that? And where Tajadud is today without him? Well, I think if I, if I have to describe Nasib in one word, I'd say decency. Mm. The man was decent to the ones. Mm. Uh, and he actually, I mean, I was never in a political party, and he 
when he created Tajaddud and called me, I said, you know, we want to join this. And I thought, I said, you know, give me a couple of hours and think about it. And I sat there. That's all you needed. That's pretty good. <laughs> and obviously the grouping, the, the, the whole group that, uh, that created Tajaddud, uh, uh, they were the most decent people on, uh, you know, on the country in my eyes. So when, when was that exactly? Which is 2001. 2001. So yeah. this is as Emil Lahoud is taking control. Yeah, so one year oh, into his yeah. presidency, yeah. Naseeb Lahoud decided to do... It was 2001. Yeah. Was that a reaction to Naseeb Lahoud? No. Uh, to Emil Lahoud? No. No, it was unrelated to that. No, I mean, this uh, this uh, uh, this small party is, is the only non-sectarian... Uh, we can say totally un- non-sectarian party that has still survives, which is not... Uh, uh, the democratic left, I thought, was also quite secular in its... It is, yeah. absolutely, but yeah. they kind of uh, withered away as, yeah. as yeah, yeah. you know, we're, 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 it's very hard, we have a very complex message to send, which is basically people are, are talking about it now, yeah. but at the time when sectarianism was, was uh, king, yeah. uh, we had a very complex message to gather people around us. Yeah. And we're not taking the opportunity today to, to gather them because, I mean, today we should be the echo of the people in the street, Absolutely. not leading them. We're just there, and if they need us for, yeah. for uh, and, you know, when, when politics come into play, that's a different ballgame down the line. What was Naseeb Lahoud's role prior to that, prior to founding the Tajaddu Naseeb, Naseeb was a businessman who, uh, his company uh, created the... Uh, power plants in the Gulf mm, mm. and came back we were in the building of Lahoud Engineering where you know he wanted to work yeah. come back here and work for Lebanon this is after the Civil War after the Civil War now the moment he was he was appointed as ambassador to the US he stopped the company working in Lebanon and taking any contracts out of principle out of principle you, you want to work in the public domain you keep your business he stood by that, and that is something that, uh, to me, was uh, very telling of the personality, and uh, uh, lured me into working, you know, with with him on on uh, with this small little party. Which, by the way, uh, uh, um, after his his death, we had we've had three elections of, of uh, the head of the parties. Another one was a Maronite, another was a was a Sunni, and. You know, it, it, it shifted from one uh, tribe he, to another he, without he, any problem. He wanted you on because of your role in media and journalism, or was it something else? Well, well it's, it's that, and that, it's, we were, I mean, he was a friend before that, mm-hmm, a friend mm-hmm. of the family, and uh, we, we had, you know, I knew him socially, and we've had a, uh, many, you know, we sit and talk and all that, and we had the same like minded people. I mean, uh, uh, because I remember you I mean, I'm trying to piece it together. Your name was associated with the, the Daily Star in, in the 90s. Yeah, right? so yeah. Hayat a little before that. Hayat was, yeah, a little bit before that. But, but your name was associated mostly yeah. with traditional journalism. Yeah. But he was looking for just people with ideas. Yeah. Absolutely, and, mm. absolutely. I mean, it, it had nothing to do. We yeah. have, uh, we still were such a diverse uh, uh, group of uh, of. Uh, yeah of people that uh, come from all walks of life. Uh, uh, and this was at a time the Syrian hegemony at its highest. Absolutely. So he, what was his personal reasons for entering politics? Was he trying to, was he in principle trying to reduce Syria's role in Lebanon? Or was that, um, was that something that was beyond him? No, no, I mean, every, everybody, there was, look, there was, at that point, there were few people that are still, uh, still believed in Lebanon. Mm. Uh, and and uh, uh, work towards it, its independence from the Syrian hegemony and all that. I mean, uh, and there were many. Some people were came out of the woodwork. Some didn't until later. Yeah. So uh, yes, I mean, he was one of that. One of them. Mm. Um, you have to realize that Nasib was very uh, critical of Hariri's uh, um, economic uh, yeah. policy. As was Samir Asir. As was Samir yeah. Asir. But, uh, yeah. but uh, uh, Nasib being in the parliament. Mm. Uh, uh, was very, very critical mm-hmm, of, mm-hmm. Of, of many of the moves yeah. and the, the format of, of, uh, of the way things are, were dealt in yeah. at the time right. uh, 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 against Hariri's uh, economic policies. 
What was Tajadud, I mean, what was the reaction of people back then to this kind of party emerging? Was it something that... Well, you had a lot of, we're, we're known to be the, uh, or, uh, the, the party of intellectuals. So a lot of the intellectuals <laughs> found yeah. refuge in that, as they did with the uh, 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 Yassad Democrati mm -hmm. at the later stage, which was uh, more younger and, yeah. and more. And there was, a, uh, there was a trial between me and Samir to merge the two parties uh -huh. together, actually. Uh -huh. At a certain point, but they stayed separate the whole time. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. But, okay. but we we had uh, and we, we collaborated most of the time on, on mm -hmm. most of the issues. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yes, it was it was a close uh, relationship between. Them. But uh, uh, there was a whole movement, in, in, uh, uh, and you have to remember the role of the patriarch at the time, yeah. the role of Colonel Chenouin, yeah. Samir Frangi was was yeah. uh, was there. I mean, you had these. Uh, 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 giant intellectual yeah. uh, uh, characters that were uh, in the game and trying yeah. to do something. Uh, um, so Tajadun was part of that story? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. part of that. The Syrians worked on dividing people and they couldn't, they, they hated when people came together from different, uh, different uh, factions. So Tajadun played a big role also uh, yeah. in that. But then the years later, of course, we now uh, 2005, and then we know that Samir Asir was assassinated. Nasir Lahoud is still in politics. He's still involved, and he yes, but unfortunately, he he had uh, fallen sick by then. Right, and so his role, his diminished role, was personal illness. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. I yeah. mean, it was uh, 2005, 2006, seven, where you know he started a bit, and then you know that was yeah. that was down him from in terms of in I terms see. of uh, ability. Can I ask you though, and I, I'm, I'm asking this from a naive point of view, I don't know the inner workings of Tajadud. The first time I've even talked about Tajadud, in Tajadud let alone. Did anyone naturally take over that role? Or was the face of Tajadud just so so symbiotic with Nasib Lahoud? Well, I mean, yes, of course it is. I mean, uh, but that, that's, a, that's a positive thing that mm -hmm. happened mm -hmm. after Nasib's passing is that we sat all together, uh, people that gathered through, through Nasib's character, yeah. and through the ethos of this, uh, of this uh, party, and we said, okay, what next? Yeah. So what next in, in other parties that say, okay, there's the brother, there's the son, and all that. That wasn't even on the agenda, right. even in the minds yeah. of his family. Yeah. So we continued with, uh, uh, with Camille Ziedi, who was at, at the time still a, a member of the parliament, mm -hmm. and we thought mm -hmm. he would be a member of the parliament. Yeah. And um, after that, we have uh, uh, Wafi Jabbar today, right. who is the right. head of uh, right. Tajadu. Yeah. So uh, we, we decided to continue. Now, obviously, uh, uh, it hasn't grown much. Uh, um, uh, I mean, because uh, the reason I'm asking you this is because it seems like the country finally reached Tajaddud's message on their own. Absolutely. And it seems like now there's no, I mean, Tajaddud is downtown Beirut, it's Sehat and Noor, Absolutely. it's Nabati. I agree. I agree totally. And we, as I said, we're not taking advantage of that. Yeah. We're not even uh, publicizing all this. And, and we're, we're extremely ecstatic and happy. Yeah. We want results. We don't want uh, <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. po political uh, party membership. That will come down the line. New so for the time not. being, it's really just embracing the moment. Absolutely. Yeah. We're yeah, yeah. embracing, we're being the echo. Yeah. We, are, uh, um, we advise a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of the uh, you know, I don't know, younger generation come yeah. to us with, with questions and, and, uh, and uh, um, you know, helping in policies and all that. But we, uh, given this... Uh, this uh, revolution, uh, we will take the back seat until uh, things move forward. I'm going to then wrap it up with a question that relates to your father's contribution to the way we type in Arabic. Yeah. I, I didn't know this. That oh, you saw the uh, you saw the uh, well. There's a nice documentary about the documentary. Yeah, about and I yeah. I did not know. I mean, this is a very sweet story, and I hope I got the name of the font, right? Because there's Mruwe is in the name of the font. Mruwe font, yeah. It's, is it Mruwe font? Yeah. That's, a, that's well, I mean, the, it's, the, is it li lino? Lino type. Mruwe lino type uh, font. Yeah. yeah. Lino type was the equivalent of Apple today. 
Okay. <laughs> so it's simplified Arabic. That's really the name what of What basically Arabic had 160 different uh, 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 letters. Mm-hmm. You know, the ha in the middle, sure. and the ha in the beginning, yeah, yeah, yeah. or the ha yeah, in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. So, so there was a whole need <laughs> yeah. of uh, uh, simplifying this because he was uh, uh, he loved his his work, he loved journalism, he loved publishing, and uh, you couldn't buy a typewriter. You had to have three or four shifts to write in Arabic. Right. Okay, so you really needed to simplify uh, uh, Arabic. So and the old keyboard was just 160 k. No, no. Uh, it has it had four shifts. Oh, four instead shifts. Instead of one shift, oh. you had four shifts. Wow. Okay, so so it was. Uh, 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 what a waste of time. Absolutely. Too. <laughs> so you needed a way of of writing Arabic simply with with the you know one shift, or with all the Arabic. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, to uh, just simplify it. Make absolutely. It, yeah. yeah. So they had to redraw the 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 the. Uh, the Arab alphabet, yes, yeah, and its uh, its ligatures between one and two, in a way to simplify it uh, and be able to use it on a modern keyboard. Now, this, if one of the reasons the Turks shifted to Latin in Ataturk's time yeah. was because you couldn't pump, publish in Arabic because it had to be done by hand. <laughs> okay, so this is a, a, a dilemma that had plagued the Arabic language yeah. for a long, long period. And my father and others worked on it. Uh, there were trials in Tunisia, there were trials in, uh, in Egypt at the time. But uh, my father's, uh, uh, because of the necessity, for, because he published a newspaper and, and, and adored what he did, yeah. uh, um, uh, pushed it through. And it, beca- it became uh, um, universal, yeah. and this became the simplified Arabic that we work with today. It's interesting. I, it's not a font, actually. Right. The font is, was, yeah. a, was a, it's just the whole mechanism yeah. of using double, two shifts instead of four right. to write the Arabic language. Hayat was opened in 1946? 46. 46. And the font, 1959. Yeah. So those 13 years, was your father and other Arabic writers, were they doing the four shift keyboard? They were either four shifts and then weren't many machines that could do that. They were actually, at the time, printing was, they used to pick with, uh, with uh, eyebrow pluckers. Okay? <laughs> You're kidding me. Yeah. And each, <laughs> each letter, each uh, uh, letter of the alphabet, yeah. one by one. And somebody will be sitting there just picking uh, an alif from here, a lamb from here, and putting it next to each other. Did you inherit any of these keyboards? Uh, yeah. I, I, this is something you should never sell. Because the, these the are... Linot- the linotype, the first linotype machine yeah. in Arabic that came to the area is sitting in Kamel's Mruwi's garden in Bitna. Oh, I'd like to see that yeah, one day, because that's, ma- that's special, time. that's special. So, Daily Star was just a few years later, it was 1952, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. the year that opened. Yeah. So, six years after Hayat, your father saw the need for an English publication in Beirut. That fledgling French one, which didn't last long, Beirut Matin, was later. And it, yeah. didn't, and it sort of didn't have a lifespan, a long lifespan. I'm curious about this long view of traditional journalism, whether it's the Hayat or whether it's the Daily Star. They're very different. I know they're very different beasts, but they're both products of a man who de- deliberately wanted to deliver expression, free expression, through the written word, out of Beirut, seven decades later, journalism to somebody like me seems like a totally different beast. And I ask you, and I'm speaking on behalf of somebody who's not the average age of the protester, I'm older, I see people with their phones and literally swiping and refreshing, looking at Twitter or Instagram, on occasion Facebook, trying to get the latest catch. And oftentimes you don't know if it's been vetted or not. But the Absolutely. point is, it's just literally instant news. Absolutely. Seven decades ago, you have somebody like your father and his team working through the keys of a four-shift keyboard. And that in itself makes you detail-oriented. And you have to really think through the next day's written word. And it requires, and it requires patience from the reader and it requires in-depth analysis from the writer. 
that doesn't seem to be easily available today. You do have some publications that still work with in-depth analysis, but even they turn to social media, and even they tend to rely more on imagery, on video feeds. You've seen a lot of this change in the last five, six yeah. decades. Do you think journalism is healthier as a result of the way we communicate? Or do you think it's actually in a, in a dangerous spot now where we don't always know what is real and what isn't? And we're, all of us could be journalists. I, I can be a journalist, you can be a journalist without any training. As, as I said, there is a, uh, this is the democracy of journalism or citizen journalism. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, uh, it has its benefits. What has changed is, is the medium. Yeah. The medium that we use today is electronic, much, much faster, the communication, you know, you had uh, the written press, then you had the radio, then you had the TV, and the span of attention of, of a reader has become much shorter, and much, yeah. uh, 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 you know, newspapers were entertaining, were informative, were, yeah. yes, but we still, is it more dangerous? In a sense, yes, because now you don't know what your sources are. It's true. So yeah. you don't know if this is fake news. I mean, the problem of fake news uh, uh, is global, and it's, uh, it affects uh, uh, um, affects elections, as we've seen in the States and so in Europe and England. Uh, so yes, it is more dangerous. That's why I think the role of being a journalist as a profession has not died whatsoever. That's interesting. Uh, okay. What has died is uh, um, is the medium, or is dying, but if you can still source it, if you, if I tell you, you know, you see something on Twitter or on Facebook or uh, a piece of news, and it's uh, it's taken, let's say, from the New York Times or taken from Anna Har for that matter, you you tend to feel that this is more reliable and more uh, truthful than just any uh, other tweet, and this is a problem that we will face more and more. But you know what? When they look the same and they produce the same way, a tweet is a tweet. They, Absolutely. They can be almost wrongly equated as both are news items. Yes. Or an Instagram photo from one source or another, they're photos. And you know what? I mean, I don't think the patience is there anymore for the average consumer to really care if it's the New York Times yeah, or if it's... But I'm saying, yes, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. But journalism as a profession has not died. Yeah. It yeah. has been diluted with... Uh, mm -hmm. Citizen journalism, yeah. but there is no authority and reliability with all these tweets. Yeah. And most of what you're getting, you're getting instant information. Yeah. Uh, many times we, we're diluted with, with information today, and what we need to do is what we one needs spends more time in thinking about that item, yeah. uh, uh, filtering that item, right. trying to, s to decide whether he believes that item or not, yeah. um, which was much less in, in your conventional uh, uh, medium that were before. So, 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 the, so journalists, in a way, journal, the profession has become, in a sense, more, more necessary to, in order to Absolutely. push back against Absolutely. that. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, uh, because you have to filter information. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, we have so much information coming in. You have to really filter it and, and, and organize it yeah. in a way where it's comprehensive. You know, I'll give you a personal story. In 2006, July of 2006, I remember the Daily Star had to cut the number of pages it could produce because of the blockade and just the difficulties of, of production. And I literally every day would buy the Daily Star. And I, I mean, I can, it's not that long ago. You'd open the Daily Star. Prior to that, we had the Herald Tribune squeezed yeah. in. So it was a rather thick newspaper, 2,000 lira, and that's your day's news. I don't remember the last time I even saw the Daily Star and its physical... Yeah. I mean, I think it's still around. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah but I don't... I haven't seen it for years. Well, I mean, and, and I'm just curious here. The Daily Star, to me, is my phone. My, my phone is the source of all my Absolutely. information. Do you think these old names, it could be Hayat Daily Star, it could be any name, a name from the, a name from the beginning of modern mm -hmm. journalism here, do you think that they will be able to survive this wave of citizen journalism? Well, I mean, in its paper form, I think it's, it's dying away. Yeah. Uh, uh, and something will come out, you know, online, obviously. We're going that way. 
Yeah. The New York Times is the most successful paper in New York, and they make more money now online than. But the, yeah. but that tells you you have to, you know, you have to be serious journalism and serious. Uh, uh, and it almost seems like a natural compromise with social media, that there that all these outlets rely on spreading their words through social media absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Your newspaper. I mean, you don't. I get it on Facebook. You go. Yeah. You go on Facebook. You have five <laughs> friends that. You trust, and yeah. if they if they have something interesting, what an article! You just double click it and see it. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So the, the window shopping, you <laughs> go window shopping for news on on, on Facebook, yeah. maybe on Facebook. or on Twitter yeah. or something yeah, like yeah. that sort. These formats have changed. So has the the music industry. I mean, before yeah. it was cassettes, then uh, yeah. then uh, vinyl, then you know, and now you go online. Yeah. It's a different format of delivering the the, the content. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, is it uh, is it perfected? No, but it has to. Is it a necessity? I still think yes, because as I, as I said, we have so much information hitting yeah. us every every day regarding anything, and so many uh, angles on a, a breaking story. There's one or something of interest that you have to filter it somehow by saying, okay, this source is um, reliable to to me. So I, you know, I'll filter already most of the stuff and go there. You know, the in-depth analysis. There's no way around it. You need to still have that old format to let the reader enjoy. Well, journalism it. today is all in-depth. There's no news in newspapers. There's no news on TV. I mean, you get it immediately. It has to be the background and the and the the analysis of um, why and yeah. how it happened and, to, and yeah. the podcast. What is this? This is what we're doing today. Unfiltered, long-form interviews, which you. You know, in the past, it's a, ra it's a radio. It's a radio show yeah. back back in the, back in the seventies. You're this right. Is exactly, and, and people yeah. still listen to that. So yes, this, it took a different format. You said citizen journalism. I mean, it, the truth is, anyone who's willing to purchase a microphone can absolutely. do this. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So in a way, that's what I said. Democracy of the of, of, yeah. of information. Yeah. Anybody is a journalist. Anybody can come out with content, whether it's worth reading or listening to. That's that's a different different ball game. Yeah. I agree. You know, as somebody who was too young to lose their father fighting for freedom of expression in Lebanon, I, I'm perhaps lucky to a point that I got to have friendship with my father later in life as an adult. And I think that was the most valuable uh, chapter of our relationship. It was the friendship. And I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess that both of these men are happy with what we're seeing today on the streets of Beirut. Oh, I have, I have no, no, yeah. no, no qualms about that. Yeah, I think this is uh, what we're seeing, in, especially if it sticks, and I think it will stick, at least part of it. I think we've uh, we've achieved the past 40, 50 years more than the last 30 years combined. Yeah, uh, 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 and I think this is uh, lasting. Um, it might not win tomorrow. But it's uh, definitely a right step, a major leap in the right direction. I'll just end it by saying that one of the nicest photos I have of my father is uh, laughing at, I believe it's your home, yeah. maybe in, in your garden. Yeah. You're all wearing matching hats. Absolutely. And I... That was actually, we were at Nawaf's lands. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. Yeah. We were at Nawaf's lands that, year, that yeah. day. And, uh, but it seems like you're debating in, a, in the nicest, in the friendliest way possible. Absolutely. And I'm sure all your ideas did not always line up. I'm sure there were disagreements at times, but there was a healthy democracy in these oh, debates. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, yeah. it, was a, it was actually uh, the last time I saw him in death. We, mm. we, uh, uh, he took me aside and we had, a, we had a long conversation for about half an hour uh, about Lebanon at the time. And, the demise of 14th of March and, yeah. that and where to go forward and things. Uh, and then we met for a very diff quick lunch just before his, his assassination. Uh, he was a, your dad was an extraordinary mind. He was a mind that, you know, one cherished. It was a, a when he called and said, we, used to, we started a little tradition coming once or twice a month on Sundays. To your house in uh, uh -huh. yeah. uh, Bliss Street, uh, me, him, and Antoine had that, and we sit and debate things, just talk. Yeah. And he he approached, in my mind, and I think of uh, Muhammad, he approached uh, uh, 
politics like a mathematician. You know, we'll sit, he was like a, the math teacher. We'll sit there, he'd throw in uh, 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 like a formula to, to decipher. And once we decipher it, he puts it all, you know, uh, uh, juggles it all together and, you know, it's a, it's a, new, uh, it's a new puzzle. And we discuss it more and more and more and more. He, had a, he was a brilliant man. Do you, do you sense with those conversations that he had come to the conclusion that the essence of March 14, even though the movement had stopped by then, it had pretty much faded from view. Do you think that he saw the mantle or the torch being carried by these kinds of groups? Whether it's Absolutely. The he didn't think that the, the, the failure was the leadership. Mm. It wasn't the people. He mm. believed in people. And he, uh, when I said we were sitting, uh, we sat at, at Nawaf's for half an hour, he was basically saying, you know, you guys are a bit away from March 14th, and you were part of all this. You need to carry that torch and, and move forward. Mm -hmm. Forget the fact that on March 14th, leadership and their parties, because that's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was the, you know, that was the essence of all the, all, all the conversation that, yeah. that, uh, that they which, in a way, the culmination of those dreams and aspirations is, to a degree, what we're seeing right now. Absolutely. It may, it may be later than all of us wanted. It may be in a, due to economic pain. I mean, that might be the catalyst. But I, I sense that if Lebanon is to enter a, a better chapter in its history, it has to be led by these kinds of people, people that want a better state, and they don't care about, they don't care about the old ways. As I said, yeah. people went down as citizens, yeah. as individuals. Yeah. You cannot have a, citizen, a citizenship in a community. You know, we, the Sunnis are the citizens. So it doesn't work that way. Yeah. People came down as individuals, they have their rights, and they, they celebrated their differences yeah. on, 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 uh, on the 22nd of, of uh, Independence Day. Yeah. There was a celebration of their differences by having these <laughs> parades, yeah. not that's by true. sect, that's true, but by professions. Yeah, and they, they, you know, they, they celebrated that. absolutely. Okay, celebrated moving into a, a different format yeah. of tribe, but a tribe which is beneficial. Uh, 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 that, that that dealt with profession, that dealt with with they were proud of what they're doing. That. Yeah, but it wasn't Sunni Shia uh, Christian. Yeah. Because we're doctors and we love what we do. We're, we're mothers and we love what we do. Yeah. We're, we're uh, 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 traders and we love... Yeah. This, is, this is tremendous. Thank you for bringing to life Nasib Lahoud. And you. your friend Samir Asir. And your dad. And your father and your own story through all that's happening. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you.